Well, as we continue in our message series, The Greatest Chapter, uh, I want to tell you about a quote. There's a quote that I think was um, Mary Shelley. She was the author of Frankenstein, and she once said this. She said, a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. Like, what amazing wisdom. A man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. And maybe you've experienced that. If you've led any type of organization, if you've led a class or a group or a team, even your own children, right? You realize that behavior modification can only go so far, especially as a parent. You can tell your kids what to do, uh, but if they're doing it just because you said so, that's kind of a miserable place to leave to live because eventually they're going to go right back to doing the things that they want to do unless there's a heart change that comes along with it. And the reason is they just simply have no desire to do those things. There's a favorite line, a favorite uh, phrase around the office that we often say to each other is, I was going to, but then I remembered I don't want to. And that's our way that we get out of everything around here. Now, the truth is that many in this room today, uh, that statement describes your Christian life. And maybe you've come to a place where you're stuck spiritually because church for you is just going and hearing somebody go through the do's and the don'ts and then trying to live the rest of the week uh, according to that list of things that they gave you. It's this outward struggle as we uh, try to carry out those marching orders, and it's absolutely exhausting. It's a miserable place to be. Listen, there's outward obedience in your life, just like sometimes we see with our children, uh, but the fact is, um, it's not the overflow of inward worship. That was the hardest thing for us as we turned the corner and parenting uh, young girls into young women was that moment when it's no longer because I said so, but now because we want you to want these things. We want you to desire these things as well, and that's a hard uh, way to parent, but it's the right way to parent. Now listen, on one hand, Uh, When you obey only when you feel like it, that's a lack of spiritual immaturity. But on the other hand, if you're trying to live by the power of the Spirit, but through your own flesh, then that's exactly the opposite way of what Paul describes the Spirit-filled life in Romans chapter 8. One writer said this, he says, if you think that the Christian life is just begrudgingly following a list of do's and don'ts, you're missing it. Does that sound like freedom, he says. Does that sound like joyful obedience to do the things that you hate doing and not to do all of the things that you enjoy the most? No, this is exactly the opposite of the spirit-filled life that God calls believers to. He changes our hearts so that the things he calls us to do are also the things that bring us the most joy. Do you hear that? The things he calls us to do are the things that give us the most joy. And so go ahead and turn with me to Romans chapter 8 as we continue in this series, The Greatest Chapter. And this week is actually part 3 of a message, uh, Hope for When You Feel Hopeless. Now you may have already discovered this, but those cool little QR codes that are on the the uh, seats in between you, the stickers on the seats, um, you can go to that and you can pick your campus and it will actually take you directly to the sermon notes. And the cool thing about those sermon notes, you can type those notes in and if you hit save at the end, You can actually come back to them later, and so we hope that you're taking notes and following along during this series. The last two weeks, we talked about the reality that you are no longer condemned. And so we said no longer condemned means that I'm guilty but pardoned, and so now God sees me as if I'm not guilty. And so that means not only are you not guilty, but you're also not hopeless. Thus the name, uh, the title of this sermon series, Hope for When You Feel Hopeless. Uh, Today in verses 5 through 11, we're going to put some legs under these truths that we learned in the first four verses. I hope you've had as much fun as we have uh, studying this passage and learning from this passage. I hope you've had as much fun as we've had teaching it. And one of the hallmarks of uh, at Liberty Heights Church, if you've been here for any length of time, is, is that, listen, we want to know what does the text say? E- even if it has hard truths, tell us what the text says and then teach us on how to live out of those truths. And so we're going to try to do that today as we uh, try to clearly explain some of these things. What does it mean to live in light of these truths that we're no longer condemned, uh, that we're no longer hopeless? How do we live by the Spirit? As we said last week, this passage is not about how to become a Christian. It's how to be a Christian. 
And so this morning, if you identify as a person that uh, is not a Christ follower, uh, I think this passage can help you have an understanding of what it means to live the life that's directed by Christ, the Spirit-filled life. And so let's pick up in uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 5. And so verse 5 says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Verse 8, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Now we turn a corner here as we come from these uh, first uh, really nine or eight verses, and I want you to hear the difference as Paul's uh, tone shifts a little bit here between verses 8 and verse 9. Previous to this, in the first eight verses, Paul was talking in the third person. And he's saying in in verse 8, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But now he switches to the second person. He says, you, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if in fact the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, verse 10, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. And then verse 11, there's so much theology and power packed into this verse. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you, that says that we have access to the very same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. I would propose this morning, I'd submit to you, that that's the greatest power the universe has ever seen to uh, bring somebody back from the dead. And we have that power if the Spirit dwells in us. Well, before we dig into the text today, uh, we've been saying this uh, phrase every single week, the bookends of chapter 8, followed by uh, something that it says in the middle. So it begins with no condemnation. It ends in verse 38 and 39 with no separation, and in between it says no defeat. So can you say that with me? Has Pastor Brad taught you anything? Has Pastor Tyler? Let's see. Uh, Here's the test. It starts with no condemnation, ends with no, and in between, no defeat. Well, that's awesome. You guys have passed the test. Here's an interesting observation about uh, chapter 8. The Holy Spirit, if you were to read the first seven chapters into uh, verse, or chapter 8, the first seven chapters um, don't talk about the Spirit as much as it does when it turns the corner here in chapter 8. I heard one writer, uh, read one writer this week, he said, listen, if you read Romans chapter 8 and you don't come away with a new understanding and appreciation of the Spirit that's in you, then you haven't read it correctly. In fact, in the first seven chapters... The Holy Spirit is mentioned just four times, and yet in chapter 8 alone, in 39 verses, the Holy Spirit is mentioned 39 times, excuse me, 13 out of 39 verses, 13 times. So four times in the first seven chapters, and then 13 times in chapter 8. Well, today we're going to focus our thoughts around three principles, three keys to living by the power of the Holy Spirit. And here's the first one, we have to vacate the throne of your life. You have to vacate the throne of your life. In the first four passages, or first four verses of this passage, Paul's declared that despite our guilty status, we've been pardoned in Christ. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And then here in verse 5, Paul begins describing two completely different sets of people. In fact, it doesn't take a lot of explanation here. It's easy to see. Um, Do we make choices based on our sinful flesh? Do we make choices based on our sinful desires? Or do we make choices based on what the Spirit who lives in us desires? It's pretty simple to understand the picture that he's painting. It's pretty easy to understand what he's describing here. But despite the simplicity of this picture that he's painting, look at the spiritual weight that this carries in verse 6. For to set the mind on the flesh is death. But to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. That term in the original language, to set the mind, literally means to prefer or to enjoy. In other words, a person who lives by the flesh 
most enjoys fleshly or worldly things. Now, this term by the flesh, it's kind of a Christianese term. Like if uh, outside of church, when we hear flesh, we think about uh, our flesh, our skin, something that we can cut. We think of bandages. But when we talk about the flesh, when Paul talks about the flesh, he's talking about those things that our sinful nature desires. And so those who set their minds on the things of The flesh desire those things. They allow those things to uh, determine their choices. But contrastly, in the same way, a person who lives by the Spirit, this person most enjoys spiritual things or godly things. Listen, both, both groups of people are looking for fulfillment. They're just finding it in completely different places. The things that you enjoy the most show what type of person that you actually are. In fact, I would propose that every single one of us has a throne in their life and someone sits on that throne. Over 30 years ago, uh, Bill Bright, he was the late founder of Campus Crusade for Christ. It now goes by crew. We have two of our uh, member missionaries that are part of the crew organization, the Marstellas and the, the Pitchers. And Bill Bright wrote this uh, amazing booklet. In fact, it's a little e-booklet that we can make available later this week to you. Have you made the wonderful discovery of the Spirit-filled life? Now, if you're astute and you were here seven years ago, you may remember when we taught this uh, from this very uh, stage during our uh, series, DNA of a Disciple in 1 John, but it's too good and too, uh, too easy to understand uh, to really not teach through it again. And so drawing from the book of 1 Corinthians, Bright writes how the Apostle Paul says there are three types of people. Let me read you some of these verses. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 says this. It says, The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Your Bible might say they are folly to him. They are foolishness to him. And so Paul is describing here the first person, which is the natural man. Over the years, many of you have uh, traveled with me on mission teams to Guatemala, and we go and we uh, do mission in the villages of San Pablo, which is in the uh, Mayan highlands in the Lake Atitlan area of Guatemala. And many of the people that uh, that we work with there, their homes do not have running water. And so you can begin to do the math a little bit. They also, in that uh, culture, don't wear deodorant. And so um, imagine at the end, of the, we do church there on Sunday evenings, and so it's a little uh, concrete uh, church building with a tin roof, and it's been baking in the sun all day long. And so that night when we were packed in there all together and we literally sit chairs out on the sidewalk, it's overflowing, like I'm telling you, it begins to get a little smelly. And one of the things that we call that, we say, is like they're el naturel. That's not what Paul's talking about here. He's not talking about a smelly, a stinky person. Uh, He's talking about uh, a natural person. This is a a person who does not accept the things of God. And the reason he doesn't accept the things of God is because he doesn't understand them. In fact, when the the word is taught, when the words are read from God's word, they just simply, it's a mystery. They can't understand them. They're foolishness. In church circles, we call this being lost or even unsaved. And this is the state of any person who does not have Christ in their life And if Christ is not in your life, he cannot sit on the throne of your heart. And we have some illustrations to help you understand this. Uh, I love this illustration. Notice that self is on the throne. And so that little picture uh, is a picture of some of us maybe in the room this morning. Self is seated on the throne of our life and outside of our life, outside of our uh, choices and uh, outside of those things that influence us, Christ sits, represented by the cross there, outside of of the circle. This is an unsaved person. This person has no desire for the things of God, no uh, hunger for the word of God. That They find no joy in the worship of God. They don't have any satisfaction in gathering with the people of God. Quite frankly, they have no desire to know Christ or to submit to his lordship. And quite simply, this person is living a self-directed life. And all of those circles there, those big circles, those little circles, those are all the desires of the flesh. They're all the the, uh, desires that come from their sinful nature, and all of those things are influencing them and the choices and the decisions that they make. This is the same person in Romans chapter 8, verse 7, where Paul says, For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. 
for it does not submit to God's law. That's what's happening right here. They're not submitting to God's law. This is the natural person. Now back to 1 Corinthians. Listen how Paul describes this next person. Chapter 2, verse 15 says, The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. And so this second person that Paul's describing here is the spiritual person. This person has Christ in his life, in her life, and Christ is also sitting on the throne of their life. And so what do we call this person in uh, church circles? We call this person saved. We call this person a follower of Christ, a Christ follower, a Christian. Back in the uh, book of Acts, they first started calling them followers of the way. When Christ is in your life and when he's sitting on the throne of your heart, your interests and your desires are directed by Christ. This person's mind is set on the Spirit, and verse 6 tells us that to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. Now, at the beginning of this message, I quoted uh, that quote that says, A man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. So does that, when you're convinced of something, when you're uh, forced to act on something that you still don't believe in, does that really sound like freedom to you? Like is freedom just another way of saying like now I'm going to have to struggle the entire rest of my life. I'm going to have to work really hard to do all of these things that I have no interest in, these boring things like praying, these boring things like reading your Bible. And the answer to that question is a resounding no. That's exactly the opposite way to describe the spirit-filled life. He actually changes our hearts. He gives us a new heart so that the things that we want to do are also the things that bring us the most joy and bring him the most joy. No doubt if you've grown up in church, you've memorized 2 Corinthians 5, 17 that says if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. And what this is describing, it's just a, a, a fancy seminary term we call regeneration. And regeneration is where uh, this problem of sin is resolved, this sin nature where we cannot please God, uh, we can't even uh, respond to God, is now solved by the old going away being replaced by the new. The old has gone and the new has come. And so here's an illustration of the person who's both saved and yielded to Christ, and Christ is actually directing their interests. And so this person is marked by the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. This person is marked by an effective prayer life. This person is marked uh, by the fact that they're empowered by the Spirit. Here's another way to put it. This is a person who lives yielded to the Holy Spirit. They are pursuing and living the Spirit-filled life. Listen, they're not trusting, they're not depending on their own willpower, their own ability to, to bear down, to try really, really hard, to follow all the rules like we talked about last week. Listen, that's not what it means. And the Spirit-filled life also doesn't mean that you have more of the Spirit than the person sitting next to you. That's really bad theology, actually. We don't quite understand. We, oftentimes we talk about that. God, give me more of the Spirit. And we often mean something different than what it sounds like. But you can't get more of the Spirit, but you can give more of yourself to the Spirit. That's what it means to be Spirit-filled. And so we have the natural person and the spiritual person. Maybe instead of calling it the Spirit-filled life, we could call it the Spirit-controlled life. That's the uh, spiritual person. And so we have these two categories that's typically where our understanding stops, saved and unsaved, right? Uh, those who are going up and those who are going down. Uh, last week, uh, we had baptism at our Lebanon campus, a young person. And so afterwards, our children's director was sitting with the kids and, and actually walking them through what it means to accept Christ, what it means to uh, become a believer. And somebody well, whispered and they said, if we don't ask Jesus into our heart, does it mean that we're going and pointed down? Yeah, that's the reality. It's somebody that's uh, the difference between going to heaven or hell. And so I told you that Paul describes three types of people in 1 Corinthians. There is one more just beside those two people. Because even if you have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of you, you may not be appropriating all the grace that is available to you. 
In other words, Christ is maybe not sitting on the throne of your life. As a matter of fact, if you're a Christian and you feel often spiritually stuck, if you have trouble consistently on a regular basis practicing the spiritual disciplines, if you have uh, trouble uh, like your faith being vibrant and alive, like it's just a list of do's and don'ts to you, then this is likely the, the prognosis for what ails you. As I mentioned earlier, verse 11 says that we have the same power as Christians that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, and yet sadly, many Christians are simply never drawing on that power. It's like driving a Ferrari, but you're driving down in the right lane going slow with your hazard lights on. You're not taking advantage of everything that's sitting under the hood of that beautiful car. Listen how Paul describes this third person. If you turn the page in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he says, but I, uh, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people. So he's describing the natural person, the spiritual person, but he's saying, listen, you, you aren't the, the natural person because you're in Christ, but I certainly can't call you the spiritual person. Verse 2, he says, I fed you with milk, not with solid food, for you weren't ready for it. And even now, you're still not ready, for you are still of the flesh. Not the natural person. Christ is inside the circle of their life, but you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? And so we call this person the worldly person. Here's an old-fashioned term that we often used growing up. It was a carnal person. And here's a slide to represent that. This person has Christ in their life, and so the cross is inside the circle, but self is still sitting on the throne. And, the, and their sinful desires are still driving their choices. They're controlled by the flesh, as Paul describes in Romans chapter 8. Let me say something that may be a little scary for some of you. If this right here is the habitual pattern of a person's life, then more than likely, over the long haul I'm talking, over the long haul, this is you, then more than likely, you're not even a Christ follower, even though you've professed Jesus Christ as Lord. The great theologian A.W. Tozer once said, the Lord will not save those whom he cannot command. Listen, there is no such thing as a lifelong carnal person. No such thing. Now you say, well, man, can a, can a Christian walk through seasons maybe like this? Yeah, absolutely. If you weren't here on uh, week one, go back to Romans chapter 7, start in verse 14, and listen to what Paul describes about himself. Paul went through seasons like this. I mean, if I'm honest this morning, I can't think of anybody uh, on this side of eternity who's living every moment of every day of every season of their life controlled by the Spirit. So let me ask you a pointed question. Does this third person that we described, and you can put that back up on the screen for just a second, does this third person describe you? Somebody that, that's saved but spiritually stuck. Do you constantly constantly find yourself turning over that new leaf, but uh, always finding yourself back under the same rock. Like, I think that some of you have described that about your life to me even. No matter how hard you try, you cannot find the joy or, or the peace that comes from breaking those patterns of sin. Let me describe it as plainly as I can. Some of us are truly saved, but battling Jesus for control of our life. Now, when we use that term carnal, means of the flesh, when we use, uh, say, a, a fleshly person or a carnal person, oftentimes our, our mind goes to somebody that's addicted to pornography or somebody that's involved uh, in, in drinking and drunkenness, uh, somebody that's involved in gossip, somebody that's always in the middle of, of uh, creating problems, like they're always stirring up trouble. This uh, does describe somebody who is in the flesh, but look back at that illustration one more time if you could put that back up there. The fact of the matter is that since Christ is not sitting on the throne of your life, you're sitting on the throne of your life. And so maybe you're not involved in those four carnal things, those examples that I just gave you. But the fact of the matter is that you are trying to do it on your own. So maybe you're not involved in that stuff, but maybe this still uh, describes you because you're trying on your own power. You're trying to play by the rules as we taught last week. You're trying to do all of these things that make you spiritual. This is the person that wants Jesus to take the wheel when things get kind of rough, but under normal conditions just wants Jesus to ride shotgun. 
And this person is unable to break from patterns of sin or unwilling to give up control of their lives. And here's some of the things that their life is marked by. Uh, the first is just legalism. Legalism is, a, is a, a big part of their life that's adding to the rules that God has given us or adding to the rules for other people, not necessarily us, but demanding that others follow a, a set of rules. It produces jealousy and guilt and discouragement. This person is often critical and frustrated, aimless, fearful, and they lack a desire to obey God. Listen, this is not the abundant life. This is not the abundant life that Jesus talks about in John chapter 10, verse 10. Listen, if Christ is in your life, he should be seated, seated on the throne of your life, saved and submissive, not just content to go to heaven someday, but yielded to Jesus in the present, not trying to keep some set of rules or depending on your own power to change things, but rather trusting in the power of a spirit-controlled life. And I think this sounds like a better way to live. Can somebody shout out amen? Amen. That's right, thank you. So here's the $64 million question. How? How do I do it? What steps do I have to take to more consistently appropriate all that the Spirit offers me? And so let's end our teaching time this morning with two, two very practical steps. And the first step is this. It's to aim for intimacy over obedience. To aim for intimacy over obedience. I don't know if you know this, I think that you probably do, but each week at uh, most of our campuses, we all teach the same message, right? It's one of the things that we think unites us as one church is that we're all consistently hearing the same thing each week. And so that means that we spend uh, our teaching team, the entire team, even those that aren't preaching necessarily that week, all gather together and we go through the text and we uh, break it down, we look at it, we look at it for big ideas, we bring uh, study materials to the text and we tell illustrations or stories that might help teach through a point. And Pastor Tyler this week had a pretty hilarious story about the importance of aiming for the right thing. Let me read you what he said. He said, when I was younger, I was practicing shooting a BB gun one day in Boy Scouts. It was competition day, and I wanted to be the best. Now, there was a kid next to me in uh, the group beside me that liked to call himself Iceman. He says, I don't know why. He asked, can you even give yourself a nickname? But Iceman did. He was Iceman. To this day, Pastor Tyler said, I have no earthly idea what his name really was. But he was cocky. And on that particular day, Iceman uh, had, uh, was extra confident in his ability to shoot And it made me, Tyler, really want to beat him. And so after a few minutes of struggling to get my aim right, I'd lined the sights up perfectly and pulled the trigger. And I watched as the BB went straight through the bullseye of the target. He says, I was so excited, especially when the instructor jumped up and said, wow, someone's hit the bullseye. And then he walked over to Iceman's target to point it out. He says, you did it, Iceman. Pastor Tyler says, I was crushed. I was the one that hit the bullseye, but the problem was I was aiming at the wrong target. (laughs) Like, how funny is that? Pastor Tyler says to this day he's still haunted in his dreams by Iceman. But let me tell you something this morning that's not funny. Some of you are doing the exact same thing spiritually, and you don't even realize it. Back in 2013, a few of you may remember Pastor Brad teaching through a short, I think it was a three or four week series called Bullseye. And and the thesis of this series was this thought that intimacy with Jesus, not obedience, intimacy with Jesus is the goal of the Christian life. Now obedience is the overflow of that intimacy, but intimacy is is the goal. And our theory is that many Christians, uh, the reason our joy and our contentment escapes us, despite our religious activity, despite our religious uh, attendance to church, despite all of these things, for far too long, we've been trying really, really hard to hit the spiritual bullseye. But despite our best efforts, we know that something is missing. Does that describe you this morning? Are you just gritting your teeth and trying harder? Here's the problem. No matter how much spiritual effort you put into things, if you're aiming at the wrong target, then your efforts are pointless. As a matter of fact, go back to Romans chapter 8, verse 8 again. 
It says, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Those who do not possess the Spirit of God cannot please God. And those who uh, possess the Spirit of God but haven't uh, enacted His grace in their lives and they're not allowing uh, His Word to drive their desires and their, uh, the things that they look for, joy and contentment and peace, that person can't please God either. And this is the person over here that has the Spirit of God but's not appropriating His grace. This is a person that's relying on their own willpower. I want to tell you something that's both discouraging and encouraging. And so if you're listening, smack your neighbor and say, wake up. Because I want you to hear this this morning. No matter how much human effort you put into it, you are never going to be able to please God consistently. And while that's bad news, here's the good news. The spirit inside you can accomplish what you cannot But this only happens when you pursue intimacy with Jesus, not obedience. Let me be very, very specific. Many of you have spent your life uh, thinking and making obedience your primary goal. So much so that many of you, many of us have grown up in churches where the teaching that we've sat under, obedience is taught as the highest virtue of our spiritual pursuits. But it shouldn't be. Now, doing the right thing, even when we don't feel like it, listen, does that honor God? Of course it does. But the bullseye that we should be aiming for is not obedience, it's intimacy. And the overflow of that life is spirit-filled, grace-empowered obedience. I think one of the best passages that uh, emphasizes intimacy over this white-knuckle obedience is found in John chapter 15. And in verse 4, this is Jesus talking, he says, Abide in me and I in you. He's describing intimacy. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I love verse 5. I try to pray this as a prayer every morning. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So apart from me, you can never please God. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. What's the evidence of a disciple of Christ? It's the fruit that they bear. But listen, when bearing fruit is the aim, that's what you're aiming at, it can be difficult to get it. Many of you know exactly what I'm talking about. That, that's a difficult thing to do. Like you're, that, you're, you're just focusing on the list of do's and don'ts. You're focusing on the rules instead of intimacy and bearing fruit is difficult. It's just like the branch that's entirely dependent on the tree for fruit. In the same way, we're entirely dependent on God for any goodness that's to come out of our lives. And so who doesn't want the fruits of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. We all want those things. In fact, I would propose to you that almost everybody in the world is seeking those things in one way or another. But the problem is that they only come from a relationship with Jesus Christ. They only come from abiding in him. That's why Romans 8, it says to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. So let's get a little more practical. What do we actually do to receive the grace that we need to obey as opposed to just trying really, really, really hard to change. Again, this is something that we've taught before and since we learn by repetition and because it's actually the steps to live out of what's being offered here in Romans chapter 8, we have to work hard to get more grace. It's our last principle this morning, work hard to get more grace. Now, if you're new right now, your heresy radar is going off. Uh, Because this is what you're thinking, like, didn't we get all the grace that we need when we were saved? And and yes, you are right. We got all the saving grace that we need when we were saved. That justification, we received all the grace that we need to have uh, an eternal life spent with Jesus Christ. The problem is that salvation, we do not receive our sanctifying grace or our empowering grace. The Bible says that he offers grace upon grace. He offers justifying grace. He offers sanctifying grace. 
And the other reason that maybe your radar is going off, because if you're new here, you might not be um, familiar with this term that we use often or this uh, language. You say grace is opposed to earning, but it's not opposed to effort. Saving grace is opposed to earning, but sanctifying grace is not opposed to effort. And if you, put for, if you do not put forth the effort to tap into God's empowering grace, then you're putting confidence in your flesh. You're that third person where self is still on the throne. You are still trying to uh, try your hardest. You're trying to do all the right things as you see it to empower God's grace, but that's not how it happens. That's not what Paul's talking about in verses five through eight. And if that describes you, you're stuck in the slow lane driving that Ferrari. At LHC, you'll often hear us talk about habits of grace. Or sometimes we refer to them as the means of grace or the buckets of grace. Uh, I've even referred to or heard it referred to as the spigots of grace. And if you're new and unfamiliar with those terms, they really can just be called the spiritual disciplines. One of the best books written on uh, spiritual disciplines is this book uh, called Spiritual Dis- Disciplines for the Purpose of Godliness. It's by Don Whitney. And each chapter states a different discipline and then says, for the purpose of of godliness. And so, Bible reading for the purpose of godliness. Scripture memorization for the purpose of godliness. And the reason that he says that is because if we pursue a discipline for the purpose of getting our lives together, like if we come to Jesus because we want him just to fix things and so we're doing all these things that we think are right and and not doing the things that we think are wrong to try to fix our lives and get uh, our lives together for God to kind of fill in some of the holes in our lives. Listen, we miss the point or, or the target. The point is intimacy with Christ and then that grows into godliness. So what are the habits of grace or the spiritual disciplines it's Bible intake, it's, it's reading, it's studying, it's scripture memorization, it's prayer, it's worship, it's service, it's solitude. Now, when we talk about the habits of grace, uh, there's something that we want to tell you that's coming up, and this is kind of a, a shameless plug here. How many of you in, in the ministry mall in the last couple months have noticed that the big next steps uh, graphic has changed? Has anybody noticed that? Anybody? Okay, yes, thank you. We got one person that has noticed that it's changed. It used to be one of the next steps was membership 101. It's where you, a class that you go to uh, to learn what it means to uh, connect and to identify with this specific body of Christ. But now the next graphic is maturity 201 and then multiplication 301. And all three of these are classes that we want every single person in the church to walk through. And we have one of those classes that's coming up in the month of August, and we're going to teach through, as an overflow of this sermon, teach through some of these different disciplines and what it means. And so we want you to sign up. We're going to have opportunity. It's a three-week class on Sunday evenings. And if you can't make Sunday evenings, we'll also do it on Wednesday evenings. So I think that we can go to, uh, yeah, lhc.life slash maturity to sign up. And so uh, after church today, there should be all kinds of sign-ups as we go to take this class, and we're going to literally walk through these things. Like, how do I study the Bible more? Like, what's a, what's a good method for studying God's Word as opposed to, you know, just waking up in the morning and hoping that God blesses me when I open it up to Judges chapter 18, verse 3. We're going to walk through what it means to develop some of those disciplines. That's part of pursuing intimacy with Christ, and then overflowing out of that will be obedience And so that's just some of the things that we'll teach through. Uh, There's many more, but those are the primary things. And when we do these for the purpose of growing in intimacy with God, we see obedience overflow as a result of his word. And when our aim is obedience, when our aim is obedience, we get stuck. But when our aim is intimacy, that's when we find life, and that's when we find peace. Listen back to our Ferrari illustration. The spiritual disciplines are the gasoline to the engine that's under the hood of our hearts. And as you pursue intimacy with Jesus by practicing these spiritual disciplines, you will be pursuing the spirit-filled or the spirit-controlled life, and obedience will be the overflow. And so let's wrap up this three-part message this morning with this challenge. Quit putting your effort 
and to keeping the rules more consistently and start putting your effort into pursuing Jesus more passionately. Can we agree to do that this morning? Would you all say amen? amen. Let's bow our heads in a time of response. God, I'm grateful this morning to have learned some of these things that are being taught in this passage in Romans chapter 8. These are the things that I've learned while here at Liberty Heights Church and what it means to find your empowering grace, your sanctifying grace. God, I'm so grateful that you didn't leave me where you found me, where I was just happy to uh, go to heaven someday and spend eternity not in hell. God, I'm grateful for the fact that you gave us the Holy Spirit to do these things. It doesn't have to be like walking through mud. It doesn't have to be this discipline that we just every day begrudgingly check off one more check mark on our list of things to do. God, I'm grateful that you've given us the Holy Spirit to live the abundant life. I'm grateful for when Jesus told his disciples that, listen, when I leave you, it's to your advantage because something better is going to happen. I'm gonna give you the Holy Spirit. God, I pray today that you would overwhelm us with this sense that we have the power in us right now. Those who profess Jesus Christ as Lord have the power the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And thank you for empowering us with that grace. God, for those this morning that can be described as that natural person that don't identify as a Christ follower, that have not yet placed their saving faith, Jesus Christ, God, I pray this morning that you would draw them to yourself that you would convict them of the sin in their life, that when they compared their life against the life of Jesus, they would understand that they fall short of your expectations of holiness. But God, that they wouldn't be intimidated by the thought of holiness, knowing that it can be achieved through the power of the Holy Spirit. God, I'm grateful that when you look down at me, even though I am guilty and deserving of hell, you've looked at me, you've pardoned me, and you see me as perfectly innocent and deserving of an eternity spent with you. God, that's my prayer for everyone in this room to experience this morning. We pray all of this in Jesus' name.